So today we're going to be speaking about the truce from July 1921 until the outbreak of civil war, which is at the very end of June 1922. Now, why would you want to talk about the truce? Isn't this the time when nothing happens? It's not. There's a, the truce is really important for a lot of different reasons. Number one, the truce is the beginning of the transfer of power from British to Irish authorities in the 26 counties in what became the Irish Free State. Number two, the truce is the time when the Republican movements split into two antagonistic parts which were to fight the Civil War. And number three, the truce is a time which can be described as a power vacuum. Now this term is used all the time, but there was an, an actual power vacuum in Ireland in late 1921, but especially after 1922, after the signing of the treaty, when there was no effective law of any kind. The British were beginning to pack up and leave, the Irish authorities were being set up, and this exposed all kinds of conflicts, which Borg will talk about, which rose to the surface under the truce. Okay, so without going on further, Borg will elaborate further. I want to say a few words about Borg. Our speaker tonight is Borg Olga Work. Borg hails from County Clare. Um, he has written three books so far about the revolutionary period in Ireland. The first book is about his home county, Blood on the Banner, about the War of Independence in County Clare. Second book about the Battle for Limerick City at the start of the Civil War. It's called the Battle for Limerick, 1922. And the third book, Revolution, which is a pictorial history of the Irish Revolution. You can pick up a copy afterwards if you're interested. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Borg Thank you very much. Yeah, do please pick up a copy because they're very heavy. They're hard back and I've been carrying around 10 copies all day. My back is nearly broken. And first of all, thanks very much to John and to the uh, People's College for inviting me to speak here. Um, obviously, this is a very important time we're living in in terms of history, and we have the decade of centenaries. I like to call it the decade of centenaries because not everything that happened during that period is necessarily worth commemorating. Um, the decade of centenaries is going to be useless if all we do is polish up old statues and gravestones and wave flags and bay wreaths. What we really need is a decade of learning. Uh, we want to emerge from that decade knowing more about this period than when we came into it. And part of that involves talking about stuff that's unpleasant, having it out, challenging old propaganda, challenging new propaganda. Um, my job here this evening really is to bridge uh, the gap between the lectures that Kieran Brennan and John Morgan Oval have given you on the War of Independence and the one that uh, John Dorney is preparing on the Civil War. Uh, I'm going to start off by talking about the end of the War of Independence uh, period uh, into the truce period and the run up to the Civil War. Uh, now, mainly I'll be focusing in the talk on the military aspects, while well, I'm perfectly happy to take questions on the political aspects and try and answer uh, as much of it as I can for you. Uh, the War of Independence is often referred uh, colloquially as the Tan War. And this is a bit of a, a misnomer. Uh, we talk about the, the IRA fighting the Black and Tans, and we tend to forget that the British forces, the old RIC with a lot of Irishmen in it, the auxiliaries were all there as well. And um, quite often, those forces um, actually did the, the, the crimes and the killings and the reprisals that the Black and Tans get named, uh, blamed for. Because we like to have a neat little version of history. We like to have the War of Independence as all Catholic Irishmen on one side and Protestant Englishmen on the, the other. And if you look at something, let's say, like the uh, shooting of Thomas McCartan in Cork, uh, which happened around uh, this time in March of 19, 1920, it's often said, oh, Thomas McCartan killed by the Black and Tans in Cork. Thomas McCartan was killed by Irishmen in the RSC at a time when there wasn't a single Black and Tan in Cork. So the War of Independence, in many ways, is a civil war. Uh, not so much between tribes, but between ideologies, between those Irish um, who saw themselves as loyalists and those who followed the Republican or some would say nationalist ideology. Um, this photograph here I like to start with, it's interesting because these are not the black and tans, these are the, uh, the auxiliaries. What do you notice about the auxiliary seated in the lorry, second from the right? 14, 15 years of age. Remember, three quarters of a million boys under the age of 16 fought in the British Army in the First World War. He presumably is one of them, or else he lied about his uh, wartime career. The other thing we tend to forget as well is that a lot, or well, not a lot, but a significant minority of those uh, in the British forces at the time, uh, in the Black and Tans, in the auxiliaries, are actually Irishmen. Photograph the auxiliaries again, I think this is uh, Grafton Street. Um, there was a great article in History Ireland magazine, I think about 2008, 2009, called Who Were the Black and Tans? And that gives the statistics. But I think about 19% of the auxiliaries and about 10% uh, of the uh, black and, or sorry, 
90% of the black and tans and about 10% of the Aussies were actually Irish born, and we tend to, uh, to forget that. One thing I think which really gets the War of Independence um, very intense uh, is the treatment of prisoners, particularly by the British. Tom Barry said about the War of Independence, the British went out to destroy us and our civilization. Um, they went down into the mire to destroy us and our civilization, and down after them, we had to go. Um, this, this is part of it. The treatment of prisoners is so bad during the war that this actually results in a lot of the, um, I'm looking for the right word here, bitter or um, uh, very, very uh, reprisal killings basically on the, the Republican side. This is Tom Hales and Pat Hart, uh, two leaders of the uh, IRA's uh, West Cork Brigade, captured outside Bandon in April of 1920. Hales and Hart were captured while hiding explosives at an IRA arms dump by the Essex Regiment. They were stripped naked, tied onto those explosives, threatened with being blown up. They were redressed, taken back to uh, barracks. They were caned, pistol whipped, thrown down the stairs, put in front of a firing squad twice and threatened with execution, uh, photographed, and then finally had their fingertips crushed with pliers. One of these men, Tom Hales, uh, who you see there on the uh, on the left uh, survived his treatment, the other, Pat Hart, who you see on the right, did not. He went insane, spent the rest of his short life in a lunatic asylum. You've all seen the film Wind that Shakes the Barry? That scene by Ken Loach is based on what happened to these men, but the one thing Ken Loach got wrong, the guy who was leading the torture was Irish. Captain Cameron Joseph O'Connor Kelly. Catholic, born in Sligo, uh, raised, I think, around Kilrush in County Clare, so I could uh, calling my fellow county man as well. And again, I think these are the things we need to, to think about the War of Independence. It is more complex when you get guys like Kelly involved. Uh, these two guys are Patrick and Harry Vatnan, two members of the IRA from Shanaglish in Galway, at the Clare Galway uh, border. Um, they were captured by the auxiliaries in November of 1920 and disappeared. Uh, we've had great controversies about disappearance recently. Let's not forget the British disappear people as well, but certain sections of the media and historical profession are only interested in dirty stuff that was done by the IRA. Um, they disappeared from British custody. The British said, oh, they escaped, we don't know where they're gone. A week later, their bodies were found. A warning, this is pretty, uh, pretty gruesome. Those are the bodies of Patrick and Harry Lachman before burial. Um, you'll notice that Patrick, uh, most of his face and his head is missing. These men were allegedly dragged along behind lorries um, to their deaths. I think the cause of death was lash generation of the skull and brain. Um, they had wounds, their bodies had been defaced, they had wounds carved into their chest. One of them, I think his arm had almost come off, they were missing fingers. Really, really uh, gruesome stuff. This is Padre Clancy, Clareman, uh, Vice Brigadier, uh, second in charge of the Dublin Brigade during the War of Independence under Dick McKee. McKee, Clancy, and a civilian, Connor Plume, often described as an IRA man, but in fact a civilian, were captured the night before Bloody Sunday and killed uh, that night, I think, after the Crow Park shootings, pretty much in revenge. Now, the official British story is that they had tried to, uh, try to escape. Uh, the British really tried to get this explanation across and produced a photograph, an alleged photograph of the escape attempt. The story was that while being held in Dublin Castle, shown here, the three men had uh, gotten hold of a shovel, had beaten their guard unconscious, found a box of hand grenades that had been left around unguarded, fought their way out, and in the course of the fight were uh, killed. That's highly spurious to say the least. The reality is they were probably killed in a reprisal. So why does this uh, treatment of prisoners matter so much? Well, at least 42 by my count, and some people have put it as high as 127, at least 42 prisoners, both IRA and civilian, while unarmed, in full British custody, were killed uh, while allegedly trying to escape. On top of this, the British begin executing captured IRA volunteers. I think they start with Kevin Barry in November of 1920. And the IRA's argument, of course, is we're an army. You can't execute prisoners, that is against the rules of war. Uh, the British argument is you're not an army, you're criminals, you're bandits, you're a murder gang. We don't have to treat you that way and we will stand out banditry and criminality with execution if necessary. 
What this leads to is the IRA taking revenge and shooting unarmed and off-duty British soldiers. At the beginning of the War of Independence, the IRA quite often captured British soldiers in ambushes, took their arms, took their weaponry, and said, wait, off you go. We can't take the prisoner, go home. But when the killing uh, shot trying to escape of prisoners begins, the IRA basically take the gloves off and say, well, if you're not going to play by the rules of war, we're not going to either. This is Private William Gill, 20 years old, from the Hampshire Regiment. In February of 1921, the British Army executed six Republican prisoners in Cork. That evening, the IRA in Cork City go out and basically start shooting and killing uh, British soldiers who were off duty walking the streets of Cork. Uh, the British executed six volunteers that morning by chance. The IRA uh, killed six uh, British soldiers that evening. They wounded a number of others. Um, so we talked about the Hague Convention and the rules of war uh, which were there at the time. Um, I would argue the British complained that the Republicans didn't obey the rules of war. They didn't wear uniforms, they didn't wear insignia, they didn't appear in the open, they were a guerrilla army, they weren't entitled to treatment as prisoners of war. Well, I would argue that the British didn't obey the rules of war either. And here's the proof. This photograph is from a British archive. It allegedly shows Sinn Féin prisoners being loaded onto a lorry. Now, they have to be very nice uh, prison guards to be sharing their cigarettes, as we see here with the men in civilian clothing with their prisoners. They have to be really nice to hand them rifles and bandoliers. What you're actually seeing here is British troops in an undercover operation wearing civilian clothes, disguised as IRA, doing the exact same thing they had complained about the IRA doing. My argument is the Hague Convention, the laws of war, weren't obeyed by either side during the War of Independence. It was the conditions of war. <coughs> side A has stood to this law, we're going to do it. Side B has taken that advantage, we're going to do the same. One thing that's been controversial as well is the uh, shooting and the, the disappearance, the killing and burying bogs of uh, British Army deserters. Now, desertion very common in the First World War. Soldiers, usually from poor working class backgrounds, fed up with their treatment in the British Army, say, right, I'm out of here, I've had enough of this, and run off, try and get, try and get home. This is a genuine phenomenon during the War of Independence. British soldiers are getting fed up and leaving. Uh, a number of them will sell their guns to the IRA en route to make the money uh, to get home. Some of them, like Reginald Hathaway uh, in Kerry, Peter Monaghan in Cork, are British soldiers who actually defect and join the IRA and die fighting on the Republican side. English Protestants being killed fighting for Irish freedom. It's not how we imagine the War of Independence. The British decide to try and capitalize on this phenomenon by uh, sending out fake deserters. Uh, guys roaming the countryside, presenting, pretending to be deserters, gather all the information they can about the IRA, escape, bring the information back to us. We don't, we know the British did this, we don't know to what extent they did it, and it's hard to pick out in these cases whether these guys are genuine uh, deserters, whether they're spies. This is the body of Private Fielding killed outside of Mallow in North Cork in April of uh, 1920. Uh, one case in Charleville is quite famous, the British um, when these guys get shot, we need to explain why they were absent. Usually they say they were deserters. Uh, two unidentified British soldiers in Cork, British claimed that these guys, the Nelly the Elephant excuse, as I call it, had run away to join the travelling circus, which seems a bit ridiculous to me. If you were in the British Army in Kabul at the moment and you saw a travelling circus go by, would you think that's going to get home? I don't think so. If anyone thinks that this treatment of British soldiers and British deserters by the IRA is particularly harsh, well, it's the exact same thing the British should be doing in the First World War. They find people wandering around their lines who they can't identify, and they shoot them, and they dump them at the side of the road. Like you see in this illustration from uh, the War Illustrated, the British propaganda magazine during the First World War. Short shrift for spies at the battlefront. So you get a guy, you think he's a spy, shoot him, dump his body at the side of the road, and look what's pinned to their clothing. Labels reading the word spy. This is exactly the kind of thing the IRA do in the War of Independence that the British complain about. Uh, but where did guys like Tom Murray learn their soldier? They learned it in the British Army. These guys were sitting at home following British propaganda magazines during the war, seeing these images. The, the way the two sides conduct themselves is often very similar. This is a genuine spy label from the British Archives in Kew in London. 
It was painted to the body of Alexander McPherson, killed just before the truce in Mallow in Cork. Pearson was a Protestant ex-soldier. And the shooting of spies is one of the most controversial aspects of the War of Independence at the moment. And certain academics say, oh, the IRA were out to get ex-soldiers and were out to get Protestants. And that they used um, the intelligence war as an excuse to shoot them. Professor Dave Fitzpatrick of Trinity College in the two islands talks about this and he said, though many of the dead had indeed uh, tipped off the police or the castle, others were the victims of numerous or pa par paranoid assumptions. Adulterers, homosexuals, tinkers, beggars, ex-servicemen, Protestants. The purity of the fight had been sullied even in the Republican consciousness well before the truce. Now I take issue with this. Uh, firstly, how would anyone at the time have known who was homosexual. Remember, homosexuality was illegal at that time. Where has Fitzpatrick got his data on this? Um, Ex-servicemen, Protestants, well, this is the thing that, that has been said. Uh, Jane Leonard uh, has talked about the IRA. We'll take ex-soldiers first in examining this. Jane Leonard has talked about ex-soldiers being hated and despised by the British Army. She said that ex-soldiers weakened the revolution's effectiveness by refusing to join Sinn Féin, subscribe to its funds, or obey the rulings of the courts. Can anyone identify that British soldier for me? Tom Barry. Tom Barry. Okay. Tom Barry, one of the most famous and successful IRA leaders of the war. Not the only British soldier. Emmett Dalton, director of training for the IRA, ex-British soldier. Ignatius O'Neill, leader of the mid clare Brigade's flying column, ex-British soldier. Dan McSweeney, training officer in Cork, ex-British soldier. William Curry, who was an ex-British soldier enlisted in the IRA as Dublin Brigades during the war, said, quote, during my service with the IRA, I met hundreds of ex-servicemen. Were the IRA prejudiced against ex-servicemen? No, I don't think so. Why would they have accepted so many into their ranks otherwise? <coughs> Memory from James Connolly in 1916, ex to the Okay, so this is the most controversial one. The IRA were they using the intelligence war as a pretext for sectarian killings of Protestants. Fitzpatrick has claimed it, uh, Peter Hart claimed it in his work, uh, Kevin Myers and Owen Harris, uh, I like to refer to them there. So there's numerous other academics and people. Uh, I'm doing a PhD at the moment. I have collated um, exact data and figures on the War of Independence. Uh, my figures are not going to give you the exact number because I haven't published this yet, but it's between 180 and 190 civilians were killed as spies during the War of Independence. Of those whose religion is known, and there's five or six whose religion I can't work out or whose religion was never established, because their identity was never established, according to my figures, 24.58% of those civilians killed as spies during the War of Independence were Protestant. Why that I'm talking Church of Ireland, Methodist, Presbyterian. Can anyone guess for me the percentage of Protestants in Ireland at that time? 24.7%. So the IRA, I would say, were equal opportunity executioners. Yes, they did kill a lot of Protestants as suspected spies. But they killed far, far more, three times more Catholics as suspected spies. And that isn't, isn't emphasized. Um, when you look at where spies were shot in the intelligence war, it's completely different in different parts of Ireland. And um, I think there's maybe 12 counties, not this off the top of my head, where no spies are shot. And on top of that, you have another seven counties where no Protestants are shot as spies. If you add that up, 19 of Ireland's 32 counties, not a single Protestant shot as a spy in the War of Independence. But when we get certain sections of the media and academia talking about the War of Independence, we only want to discuss one thing, the alleged sectarianism of the IRA throughout Ireland. What they're really talking about is Cork. In Cork, 30.34% of those killed by the IRA, such as George O'Connor here, as spies, were Protestants. Again, that's according to my figures. Slightly high than the, uh, than the national average, but remember, places like Bandon in West Cork was known as the Little Derry of the, the South. There was a huge Protestant population there at the time. Um, so all this stuff that's been said about sectarianism and the intelligence form of shooting the spies, I think people have been too quick to jump to conclusions. As I said, I'll hopefully be producing this uh, data when I finish my, my studies. 
Let's just take a quick look uh, at some of those counties and the intelligence for County Armagh. You can imagine right up there in the north, a lot of sectarianism, two spies shot, both Catholics. County Clare, <laughs> three shot, all Catholics. Galway, three, all Catholic. Leash, two, one Catholic, one Protestant. And again, you can see here their full name, you can see the date they were killed, their religion, and whether they had previously been in the, uh, in the British Army or the RIC or not. So I'm not using anonymous people here uh, to collate figures. These are actual people uh, killed. Uh, Dublin, I think it's 13 killed. Uh, we look at the first one there, William Jack Straw. I think he's shot out by Balbriggan. His religion, unknown. His exact identity was never established. So he's one of the five or six whose identity I can't, uh, I mean, religion we don't know. But of the 13, there are one, two, three, four Protestants killed, one unknown, and the rest of Catholic. So we've talked a bit about the War of Independence, so we're going to talk about the end of it now and how the truce came about. Basically, it's not just military. There was a huge amount of <coughs> political pressure on the British at the time. The British had passed the Government of Ireland Act. There was elections for that coming up in May of 1921. That was going to establish two parties, one in the six most northeastern counties, today known as the North in Northern Ireland, and one as Southern Ireland for Southern Ireland. When the election happens, it's completely polarized. And in the South in particular, all the seats except for four for Trinity College are all one by Sinn Féin. Now this creates a crisis for the British. They predicted this was probably going to happen anyway. But they need constitutionally the Southern Parliament to meet. It has to meet by the 14th of July under the terms of the Act. If the Parliament does not meet by that date, the British have to declare Crown Economy government. What does that mean? Essentially it means martial law. That would be a huge embarrassment for the British. So the British have two options here. They can keep trying to find a political solution to this, or they can go down the road of imposing a military and political solution. So this is Crown Economy government and martial law. Uh, General Neville McCree, who was commander of the British forces in Ireland, said he would need 100,000 extra British troops to put down the rebellion in Ireland. Now where are they going to get them? Britain was fighting in the Russian Civil War on the side of the White Russians. Uh, I think they were putting down rebellions in Egypt. Uh, they were in Iraq at the time. Uh, they were basically overstretched. This would be a real draw on resources to try and get that many troops. McCready also said they would need to shoot up to 100 Republicans a week, often without court martial. We find a guy using arms, we just shoot him down on the spot. It's pretty much what they were doing anyway, but in making it public would obviously not have been very popular. The other thing is that the British public fed up the war. It was costing £20 million a year. And there was huge pressure on the British from the Empire, Canada, Australia, big Irish communities complaining about what was going on. Britain's wartime ally, America is fed up with it as well, and a huge Irish body there. So between May of 1921 uh, and uh, the truce in July of 1921, the British try and have one last push. I should say as well, before I move on to that, that a truce had actually been possible in November, December of 1920. Um, negotiations were underway. They were churning away in the background all the way through. By December of 1920, Michael Collins was on the run. Griffith, who I think was in prison. Uh, de Valera was in America. He's not really involved in this. But had actually pretty much agreed terms for the truce with the British. The problem was there was huge confusion as to who the British were actually dealing with and you had people sticking their oar in when it wasn't wanted. Roger Sweetman, uh, Sinn Féin TV for Wexford, isn't happy with ambushes, regards them as uh, immoral, and just jumps up and says, uh, oh, I, I want to negotiate a truce with the, the British. Uh, Patrick uh, Moylet, who was a Republican businessman from Galway, a Galway Mayo area, says, I, 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 I'm going to secure a, secure a truce. Father Flanagan, uh, who's vice president of Sinn Féin, uh, again say, needs his own truce initiative. And when the British see all these different ones springing up, they go, hang on, there's something happening here. The IRA are desperate. Shouldn't we have a truce at all? And then when a truce is almost agreed, in December 1920, the British military authorities step in and say, do not sign that. Give us two months. Two months, we guarantee you, we'll wipe out the IRA. They're on the run. We have them on the ropes. And that was a missed opportunity. So the British, uh, six months later, are still trying to finish off their two-month job. There was one last big military push. The British thought about bringing in extra troops. 
and using new tactics. One thing they developed, the Essex Regiment and West Corp, developed their own fine columns. Let's get off the roads blocked by the IRA. Let's get out of our vehicles, take to the hills, chase the IRA. It's a good initiative, but it doesn't produce huge results. The other thing the British do is they organize sweeps and roundups. Get every available British troop. Pick an area where we know there's been an ambush. Surround it. Surround the water side with uh, British destroyers. Fly airplanes overhead and we'll walk through and we'll catch the IRA. We'll tighten the loose around them. And it doesn't work. And the reason why it doesn't work is because the IRA obviously hide their guns. They're arrested with a lot of civilians. The Irish and the RSC have either quit or are too scared to identify who's who. The British don't know who they're dealing with. And you have what you see here in the photograph. Dozens of young men lined up. British officers going up and down questioning them, quite often in areas where you've only got monoblot Irish speakers who haven't a word of English. And their options are either let them all go or take them all prisoner. So the sweeps don't really seem to work either. And then the British adopt larger, uh, larger uh, patrols with like an armoured carriage you can see here. Makes it very difficult for the IRA, uh, but not impossible to ambush and attack them. And the IRA is trying to make engineering leaps, making their own hand grenades, making their own landmines seeing what they can do to disrupt bigger patrols like this. So does any of this actually work? Not really, is my argument. The British job in Ireland was the restoration of order. And you see here the figures for RIC, DMP killed, British Army killed, and total reported outrages to the RIC. January 1919, beginning of the War of Independence, two RIC men killed at Soahead Bay. Zero British soldiers killed. Total reported outrages, 198, so just under 200. Let's go down to November of 1920, uh, the time of Bloody Sunday, killed Michael Ambush. Um, number of RIC and DMP killed, 37. Number of British soldiers killed, 23. Number of outrages, 1,335. Now after that, the British introduced martial law and monster. They introduced the execution of prisoners. They introduced all sorts of new stuff. And you come down to June of 1921, 41 police killed, 20 British soldiers killed, 2,256 reported outrages. Despite everything the British tried, they were not being able to put the lid on this. That doesn't necessarily mean, however, the IRA were winning. Let's be clear about this. The IRA were never, as a guerrilla army, in a position to drive the British into the sea like St. Patrick with the snakes. That was not going to happen. But the longer the struggle continued, the better uh, their bargaining position came. Even if the IRA had completely broken the will of British forces in the south, there was a huge problem in the north with the Loyalists. The Loyalists had been organized into the special constabulary, the three specials. People with local knowledge, who knew the area, who knew the people, who were well armed, not well disciplined, but well armed, they were a very effective force fighting the IRA in the north. And even in the scenario, if the IRA completely defeated the British in the south, they would have had a huge problem in the north. Anyway, let's not go into that counterfactual history. Let's talk about the IRA's actual position. Burning of the Customs House, major event, big propaganda victory for um, the IRA, daylight raiding a tent in the middle of Dublin City. But the IRA were already in Dublin very low on ammunition. The burning of the Customs House cost them heavily. Five IRA volunteers killed, another 80 or more taken prisoner, including many members of Michael Collins' famous uh, squad, and dozens of revolvers and pistols captured. You can see here British, um, British uh, officers actually investigating or having a look at uh, IRA weaponry which had been captured, not just in that, but in other raids. Uh, the IRA in Dublin were desperately short of ammunition and manpower. Here the whole time the IRA only had enough ammunition for two weeks left in Dublin. The problem in Dublin was you attacked a lorry of British soldiers. You didn't have time to go to fight the ambush to a finish and go up and get them to surrender and take the rifles and ammunition. You could do that in Cork, you could do that in Clare or Leash or wherever. You couldn't do it in the streets of Dublin City. The remains of the squad and the Dublin Brigade Active Service Unit were amalgamated into the Guard. They tried to make basically a, a stopgap military unit. This later became the Dublin Guard, famous, or should I say, infamous for events in Kerry. 
And just to show you how bad things were, Daniel MacDonald, who was an intelligence officer with A Company, 1st Battalion, Dublin Brigade, talked about IRA units in Dublin stealing from each other to try and get ammunition. Talked about, if you know anything about ballistics, IRA volunteers getting 303 rifle ammunition and sawing it in half to try and put it into revolvers. This is crazy stuff. They're desperate. And Daniel MacDonald says, Things were so bad with all the units that it was a question of how long could they last? Would we last a month? Would we last a fortnight? The only reason was we had little left to fight with. We had no ammunition, we had a few guns. Now that's the situation in Dublin. It's bleak. And Richard Mulcahy, Chief of Staff of the IRA, put a lot of store on what was happening in Dublin. We we'll look down the country. This is the um, uh, West Mayo Flying Column photographed a few days before the troops. Every one of them has a near and field rifle. But as well armed as British soldiers. And Vice Commandant Patrick Joseph Cannon, who's photographed here, I think he's in the back row, says, the troops found us in good form. Our morale was high. We had about 100 rounds per rifle. In fact, we had more arms and ammunition uh, than we had men for. We put more men uh, under arms by redistributing the ammunition. Basically, they're in a good position to keep fighting. So it's, it's very patchy. The other way in the Midlands has been inactive. You know, we don't think of me, the Malish, and Afghanistan has been particularly active, but they were starting to get active at the time, and that was a problem for the British. Really, what it boils down to, I'll take a quote from each side. Sean Clifford, mid Limerick Brigade. Limerick, by the way, does not get enough credit for the uh, Republican struggle that was very strong. He analyzed it perfectly. He said England could have beaten the IRA in perhaps a week or so if she had waged war as was usual at the time. That is for use of artillery, tanks, gas, aeroplanes. England, however, could not do these things because she had told the world she was rescuing the Irish people from a murder camp. There was no solid reason why the IRA couldn't hold out indefinitely, provided England continued on with her contemptible black and tanks. They couldn't go in. They couldn't level whole towns and villages and shoot 100 people a week. It would have caused outrage internationally. British and public opinion wouldn't have taken it either. And the other thing we find in civil war divisions later is that usually the Free State guys argue the moment we were finished, we couldn't continue. And the Republicans say the treaty was a settled, we should have fought to the end. Sean Clifford went Free State, and he's arguing we could have held out, but the thing was going nowhere. Montgomery, uh, intelligence officer in Cork during the War of Independence, later British hero of World War II, his own comments on it in 1924. To win a war of this sort, you need to be ruthless. Oliver Cromwell or the Germans would have settled it in a very short time. Nowadays, public opinion precludes such methods. The nation would never allow it, and the politicians would have lost their job if they had sanctioned it. We could probably have squashed the rebellion as a temporary measure, but it would have broken out again like an ulcer, an ulcer the moment we removed the troops. The only way, therefore, was to give them some form of self-government. The opening of the Northern Parliament in June of 1921, uh, the British King makes uh, a speech that's conciliatory with the, all these peace negotiations involving the Prime African Prime Minister, Jan Smuts and Lloyd George and De Valera. And eventually, De Valera sends a letter asking for peace, or sorry, De Valera sent a letter by Lloyd George asking for peace negotiations to begin. Uh, the actual truce is signed on the 8th of July 1921 here in Dublin at the Mansion House. This is General Neville McCready, commander of British forces in Ireland, on his way into that meeting with Dublin's Lord Mayor. What do you notice about his uniform pocket? <laughs> he has a gun in it, you can see the outcry. This was picked up by the press. Uh, he got in a lot of trouble for it, and he said, I learned many things in my time in the Emerald Isle, but trusting the Irish wasn't a um, The truce is agreed on Friday, it comes into operation on Monday. Why was there that gap of three or four days? Basically, they needed time to get the, the word out. Um, for example, you British units down in Cork getting the message by carrier pigeon, because all their phone lines had been cut, and there was a delay. They needed time to let everyone know this was happening. Exact same thing happened in the First World War. The 11th day, the 11th hour, the 11th month. Yeah, but the ceasefire had been agreed six hours beforehand. And that was with much better uh, uh, communications in a different type of war. Some units in here about it when we're talking about Africa for weeks later. The First World War continued in Africa for two weeks after that. Um, and other places, yeah. Um, in that time, there's been a lot written, and this is actually what I'm doing with my PhD on, on 
oh, the IRA launched one last push and tried to kill as many people as possible and had all these sectarian killings of Protestants and all this stuff. And a lot of it's propaganda. Uh, certainly, some very grisly things were done. This is the uh, shooting of four unarmed, off-duty British soldiers in Cork the night before the truce. Um, absolutely a war crime. You cannot take unarmed soldiers and shoot them. Um, but this is the kind of thing that had been happening all through the War of Independence by both sides. Um, there were reasons for this, and I would link this back to the shooting of, um, again, Republican prisoners captured by the British. There's other instances and stuff that's been written about the truce, like uh, Constable Alfred Needham shot in the next. He'd just gotten married that morning. He was walking out of the church with his new bride. The IRA had been tipped off. They ran up, stuck a gun in his back, and blew him away. And they knew the truce was coming. Great story, make a great Hollywood movie. Absolute fiction. Uh, Councillor Alfred Needham was killed, but he was killed by an IRA unit that did not yet know the truce had been agreed in Dublin. There was no marriage. He was a single man. Someone cut that up as propaganda. But the last people killed in the war, there's always going to be a story that all oh, those killings were unnecessary and moralised, but not been saved. The other thing which people are talking about, the truce and the killings in the immediate days before it, don't talk about is the number of people killed by the British. For some reason, there's this really big focus on those killed by Republicans, and then there's no mention of those killed. Because the British went on killing people in the final days and hours as well. This is Dennis Spreeze, unarmed IRA volunteer, captured his home by the British military in Cork, said, hands up, you got me, put him onto a lorry, ah, he was shot trying to escape, he tried to run away from us. This is a photograph outside Dublin Castle when the truce actually does come into effect, and basically, it's, things do grind to a halt very quickly. Now there's a number of killings and incidents during the truce I'm gonna talk about now in a minute, but basically that puts a cap to the war of independence. I, I'm gonna talk about some very controversial things in a few minutes, like the Domanway killings and all that sort of stuff. And I'm saying at the start, if you're looking at the truce, even if someone was not former, even if someone had done something really dirty during the war of independence, there's a ceasefire. You're not supposed to kill people during a ceasefire. The IRA basically have no idea how long the truce is going to last, neither the British. The IRA use it as a training opportunity. Here we see an IRA uh, unit in the Midlands, and look at them again. They're not in uniform, but they have proper military rifles, they have proper discipline, they're in the open, they're forming into an army. The treaty debates and the politics around this book, I don't need to go through, but you, everyone here knows it. Yeah, pretty much you all know the, the politics of the, the time. Uh, the treaty is signed in December of 1921. Um, it splits Sinn Féin, it splits all the Republican organisations. Uh, basically, North Ireland is going to stay within the Union, local government there, but it's Unionist dominated, that's copper fastened. South Ireland really is what the Civil War is, is, is about. It largely gets independence. They didn't know what we the independence we have now, but realistically it's getting independence as the British Dominion. It gets its own government, its own army, its own flag, its own police force. But well, here's the crucial thing, still inside the British Empire. British King, head of state, and you would have to swear oath of loyalty to the British King. That was a huge stumbling block for anyone who was a doctrinaire Republican. Flora Bentley said about the War of Independence, he said, a lot of guys fighting it, Republic was just a word for independence. They didn't understand Republican politics quite often, they didn't know what it meant. It was really that the War of Independence was kind of for some of the guys like that, some of them were die-hard doctrinaire Republicans, but for some of them, and in all these different strands, it was just, let's get the British out. We're worried about what happens after this. Let's just get them out. And the War of Independence really, or sorry, the Civil War, key issue was not the North. Go back and look at the treaty uh, debates. Only a few people like Sean Wyman actually mentioned the North. It's the oath and the empire. That's what they're talking about. We talk about the split that occurred in Sinn Féin and in the, the IRA. Um, we divide it very neatly into two camps. And again, history is more complex than this. We say, oh, De Valera supporters, both the treaty, Michael Collins supporters, were in favour of it. And we forget about two of the other big leaders, Tom Griffith, Liam Lynch, Ernie O'Malley, these people in their thoughts that aren't, uh, don't come into it at all. Um, realistically, you've got a number of different, different factions here. Let's take the pro treaty side. Michael Collins is the military leader, Arthur Griffith is the political leader. Now I know Michael Collins assumes a lot of political powers, but Arthur Griffith, first man to sign the, the treaty over in London. Griffith is 1905 Sinn Féin Manifesto Dual Monarchy, 
Griffith really didn't have a problem with the idea of a monarch in Ireland and links that way, and didn't have as much a problem with the, the empire. He kind of regarded the treaty as fait accompli. Michael Collins, Irish Republican royal, secret conspiracy, he was out fighting in 1916. He regards the treaty as a second stone. We're not there yet. You know, we're going to use this as a springboard. This is not finished at all. What's Collins doing during the truce period? He's sending guns to the Northern Ireland. He's saying we're going to pull this thing apart of the British back. Griffith, taking a hold of this. Will you agree with it or not? So that's the pro treaty side, the number of different factions within it. Let's look at the anti treaty side. Uh, De Valera. Oh, De Valera, and if he'd signed the treaty, and De Valera and the stuff went down the Civil War. By the time they're fighting against the Civil War, as far as the Republicans are concerned, De Valera is a nobody. The English is the man in charge. During the fighting in Dublin, what's De Valera doing? Is he commanding a battalion? Is he in the four courts? He resumed his status as an orderly volunteer. Liam Lynch is the guy that's in charge. The Civil War ends when Liam Lynch is killed. Liam Lynch famously said, we have, we've gone out for a republic, we will live by no other law. He's one of these guys like Ernie O'Malley, Liam Meadows, he's kind of a doctrinaire Republican. Full independence, republic, that's what we're out for. De Valera, document number two. We can have external association with a republic inside the British Empire. It's a bit confusing, but basically, it's not the same thing as Lynch. So what I'm saying is, the lines are blurred here, even on the pro treaty and the anti treaty side about politics. Uh, the IRA, obviously, like all the other organizations, split. Uh, discipline breaks, breaks down. Uh, there's a lot of drinking during the truce period. If you've just been part of the army that finally freed Ireland, you can honestly call it a ton of put your hands in the pot. And everyone wants to be tailors ran out of green material for making IRA uniforms because every young man wanted one, whether he was in the IRA or not. And both sides during the Civil War, you can see the um, graffiti here on Arnold Larry from Dublin, we had no time for truces. Both sides accused the others of being truceers. Where were you when the war was being fought? We were the men who did the real fighting, and we were for or against the Treaty of Ireland. This is a breakdown of the uh, divisions during the War of Independence. Uh, black and white map that pulled off the internet. Um, the graphics are a bit unfortunate. It looks like Scotland has invaded and taken half the country. Um, what you're talking about really is, I mean, even maps like this don't do it justice. Dublin City is, is, is split. You're walking from one block to another. And it's a bit like Ukraine at the moment. You've all these armed factions taking over barracks, and taking over buildings, and jostling for positions. That's what it was like when the IRA split. We'll take on Clare, for example. Clare on this map is identified as being pro treaty. Its leader, Michael Brennan of the First Western Division, was pro treaty. And East Clare was pro treaty, and, and Galway. Uh, go to West Clare. Not at all. Anti treaty, patches, changes from town to town. Personality is an interesting here. Two predominant Republican families in Clare, the Barracks and the Brennans, and they hated each other. From 1918 onwards, these guys were always uh, rowdy. And basically, uh, when the war of civil war starts, five Republicans are executed by the Free State Army. <laughs> all five Republicans are from Barracks Brigade area. And all five are executed in an area a military authority is run <coughs> by the Brennans. This stuff got person. Um, if you look at units, I think it's uh, Middleton and Cork. Cork pretty much solid the Republican. And then the Middleton unit, to a man, goes free state. There had to be some personality clash or something going on there. Sibirine as well, just you get these little pockets. So the whole country is, is, is confused. You've essentially got three different authorities in it. You have the, the British government and forces in the north. The British are still in the south at this time, but are evacuating. And you have pro treaty and anti treaty. And all these guys have their own armies, they have their own police forces. The country is in chaos. You know, I see it disbanded in, I think, February of 19, February, March 1922. A large number of them head off to the north and join the RUC. Uh, uh, there were 44 people killed, I think, during the uh, truce period by the IRA, and quite a number of them ex-RIC men. But whether you got targeted during the truce or not depended a lot on the war of independence activities. For example, this is a past thing where the 3rd Northern Division to an RIC man saying, this guy had been friendly to us, he passed information, don't touch it. So quite often, um, they didn't just want for any RIC man, quite often it was targeted. Again, to stress, the truce is on, these killings are not justified, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't some reason they weren't completely valid. 
Uh, this is a great uh, article from the Irish Examiner about the black and tan protests in London. When they're demobilised, they all go back to Hyde Park. And, you know, huge unemployment in Britain. It's where a lot of the black and tans come from. And when they go in looking for a job, what, what was their last employment? Oh, I was a black and tan in Ireland. No job for you. Uh, so they actually held a protest in Hyde Park to complain about their lack of employment, but the British public didn't exactly uh, rally to them. A lot of them end up listening in the Palestine gendarmerie and were sent out to uh, Palestine, Israel, whatever what you want to call it, remember the British were uh, there at the time as well. So the British military starts to draw after the RSC goes. <coughs> and what you have here is a photograph of the taking over of the barracks. Three state army standing outside, waiting to take over, British marching out, and you'll see one of the British officers is saluting. You see the Free State Army have their arms at uh, their rifles that present arms. That's a military salute. The two sides are giving kind of grudging respect to each other. But during the Civil War, it's important to remember the British gave very important military assistance to the whole treaty side. It was in their interest. They wanted to see the treaty upheld. This is a handing over of Beggar's Bush Barracks in Dublin, the first one handed over. That's uh, Paddy O'Daly, I think, receiving the flag there from Richard Mulcahy and Owen O'Duffy is behind him. The barracks in Dublin are formally handed over with great ceremonies and pageantry. Down the country, it's a free for all. The British are pulling out and their orders are, give over your barracks to the IRA. Which branch of the IRA? Whoever is in the area, just pull up the sticks, get out. The British concentrate their forces in Dublin and from there, uh, will retreat backwards. So again, like I said, Ukraine at the moment, different guys scrambling to take control of barracks and government buildings. By this time, the IRA and its pro and anti-treaty factions have the lines are fairly obvious. Um, the Free State government wants the pro-treaty troops in the Dublin Gang taking over the barracks to look pretty smart for propaganda reasons. So they get them all tailored into these green uniforms. From this stage onwards, I want to call them Free State Army. I know some people prefer the term National Army, but just that the Army fighting for Free State. That's, that's what I'm using. Um, crisis break out over who's going to control these barracks. The Civil War begins at the end of June 1922. It almost begins in Limerick when the British withdraw. The areas Republican dominated, but Michael Brennan and the Free State Army are ordered in by Richard Mulcahy to take those barracks and can't afford to lose Limerick. Guns are drawn, barricades are pulled across the streets, the Republican reinforcements from Cork Tipperary and everywhere flood into Limerick. Ernie O'Malley has the castle in Limerick, King John's Castle, besieged, and he says to Rory O'Connor, Give me explosives, I'll blow down the walls, I'll go in, I'll kill them all, we'll take back the place. And basically, uh, Rory O'Connor refuses. It was posturing in a crisis for a number of weeks in uh, Limerick. The Free State are sending in troops and armed cars like this one, but the fighting does not actually break out, it's avoided. The Free State Army will draw the Republicans take the barracks. Belfast, truth isn't happening up there, not happening in the north. Roddy McCordy, Roger McCordy, uh, who was head of the IRA in Belfast at the time, I think famous to said the truce, I think lasted about six hours. Uh, rioting, uh, sectarianism, IRA attacks on the RIC, RIC uh, specials, revenge attacks on Republicans, that's continuing the whole time. Uh, Mac Mahon kills be a good example of this. Two special constables uh, killed in an IRA attack um, in Belfast City Centre. Shortly after that, two Catholics are shot by unidentified mm -hmm. gunmen, probably uh, special constables or uh, police. That night, um, men in police uniform using sled sledgehammers break the way into the home of Owen McMahon, who is a wealthy Catholic, no connection to the attacks, no connection to the IRA, no connection to the Sinn Féin, it's a home ruler through and through. There's eight men in the house, they're all taken, put downstairs, they're told to say their prayers, and they're shot right there on the spot. 68 are killed. Things happen there down the south, which people very quickly jump to in the little <coughs> sectarian. Particularly again, I'm talking about media reports and value of such history. Um, this is a photograph of a Protestant run orphanage for girls in Clifton in Galway. In June of 1922, just before the Civil War breaks out properly, a uh, Protestant run orphanage for boys at Ballyconry is burnt to the ground. Now, when you read about this, quite often it says the IRA burnt down a home for Protestant orphans. 
God was not terrible, they could sectarianism. Well, the orphanage was run by Mr. Charles Perkis, and he overheard a conversation with the um, local IRA leader that his daughter had. He reported this to the British, and here's what he says. Bally Canary Orphanage had been destroyed by the IRA uh, because it had been used as a training school for boys to serve in the British Army. This is what the IRA are alleging. Further, the local IRA officer alleged that the IRA were in possession of evidence which proved that the Boy Scouts from the orphanage had been guilty of espionage and that the establishment at Bally Canary had been used for entertaining British forces during the war. All of which charges were more or less true. Again, burning children out of an orphanage, regardless of who's running it, is, you know, not a thing to do. Um, and this is completely unjustifiable. But is it sectarian? That's the question. Let's not leap to conclusions. This brings us on into something I'm sure you've all heard about, very controversial, the West Cork Massacre, April 1922. I cannot strongly enough recommend Barry Keane's book, uh, the title of the West Cork Massacre, just published by Mercer Press. An excellent book which goes through this in detail. I'm just going to skim over the top of it. On the left here, Michael O'Neill, acting commanding officer, 1st Battalion, 3rd Corps Brigade, IRA, goes to the house picture, Valley Groman House, owned by the Hornybrook families, uh, Protestants uh, living near Owens in Cork. They, uh, the IRA basically have gone there, they want their car, and they're taking them for a joyride or a trip. Apparently, this is something they had done times before and had returned the car in one piece. The Magneto had been taken out of the car, couldn't start the car back then without it. Uh, Michael O'Neill climbed in the window you see there over the door into the house. I think they demanded entry and he refused. He climbed into the house um, and he was shot dead by Herbert Woods, an ex soldier relative to the Hornibooks living inside. Um, now, of course, the Hornibooks didn't know who was outside. Remember, the country was in anarchy at the time and anyone could turn up claiming to be the IRA or anyone. Um, what happened was O'Neill, as I said, was killed. <coughs> Where were the local IRA leaders when O'Neill was killed? Well, O'Neill was the local IRA leader. He had been put in charge because everyone else, like Sean Hill, as you see photographed here, and all the other court leaders, like you mentioned, were in Dublin trying to prevent the civil war breaking out. So you don't have normal working conditions in court when this happens. Anyway, three men from that house. Herbert Woods, his uncle Samuel Hornbrook, and Thomas Hornbrook are taken away, they're shot or killed by the IRA, we're not certain how, and disappeared. Bodies are never found. Over the following two nights, ten other Protestant loyalists are killed in Cork. All of those killed were Protestant loyalists, but not all the loyalists attacked were Protestants. Some Catholics were attacked, um, were attacked uh, at that time as well, ex IC men in particular. Was there an intelligence thing to these killings? Well, that's obviously very difficult to, uh, to tell. The IRA, however, did have very good intelligence in that area. Flor Crowley, part of the Dunmanway workhouse where the auxiliaries were stationed, he shared a room with the local auxiliary intelligence officer who was in barracks. So anything passed across his desk, notes were being taken by Flor Crowley, who was passing it to the IRA. Now, there's other people who've done a lot more research into this than me. I'm on the side again, Barry Keane, or Andrew Bielenberg, Dr. Bielenberg of uh, UCC. Some intelligence links uh, have been established between these guys and the British during the War of Independence, but not all of them. Um, it would seem to be that this is a necessary targeting by this targeting loyalists. Pretty straightforward, it's revenge for the killing of O'Neill. Um, but again, to reiterate, the truth is not. Even if every single one of them had been destroyed, there's a true sign that killing is not justifiable. This is sectarian again. They could all mind up. As I said, all those killed were Protestant, not all those attacked that had all been fired into were Protestant. Some Catholics were targeted as well. But I'm going to talk about something fairly controversial here. I know John Morgan touched on it in his lecture uh, to you. Sexual assault and rape during the War of Independence. Photograph of the British patrol uh, up in Monaghan during the War of Independence. In the middle are two women dressed in pretty much black and tan attire. These are women police searchers. Sexual assault during searches by British troops on Irish women is very common. To solve this problem, 
these uh, were brought in, these women, often uh, nurses from the First World War. Um, rape wasn't used as a weapon of war during the War of Independence, but rapes were committed. Uh, there's examples of a, a British soldier in Cork is caught in the act of raping a local woman in Cork City. Um, there's another British soldier who brought to trial for uh, raping and killing a local woman, um, but he is not charged with it. And during the truce, there is a fairly horrific incident which happens in Tipperary, according to the press at the time as the Tipperary outrage. Now, this occurred on the 12th of June 1922. Harry Biggs, I think she was the wife of the local landlord, uh, was raped by a number of her men at by a number of men at her home in Hazel Point. Seven men were alleged to be involved, and I'm choosing my words carefully here. All were alleged to be members of the Dreminer IRA company. Four suspects were arrested, they were taken and brought before a Republican uh, court. Now obviously remember back this is a completely different time, there's no DNA evidence, there's no uh, CSI. Thomas Webb, who lived at the house, gave evidence to the court that he could not posi positively identify the accused and they were released on bail. He did say, however, that they were wearing the IRA uniform. The Biggs fled to England, so there was no one there to give definite evidence linking the four suspects to the crime. The trial didn't proceed, and you know what? I wouldn't blame them for running away to, uh, to England. Another suspect who left Tipperary this time and came to Dublin was Martin Hogan. He joined the IRA's Dublin Brigade and he was abducted and killed by Free State forces in April of 1923. Ken Mary's we're going into the Civil War here, but just I want to, to put all this into context. Paddy O'Daly, former member of Michael Collins' squad, head of the um, uh, head of the Free State Army in Kerry, he and two other officers were accused of sexually assaulting the daughters of Dr. Randall McCarthy and Ken Mayer in June of 1923. Now, Dr. McCarthy was a Free State supporter. I think this only came to light because of his political connections and because he and his daughters were wealthy or educated. If they had been Republican supporters from the back of the army who didn't have money and education, would events like that have come to light at all? But the women, apparently, again, these things were reported as incidents and outrages. They, they wouldn't discuss rape in the papers. The women were flogged and smeared with acts of grease by O'Daly and two other Free State officers. O'Daly and her officers were never formally convicted of this, but that ended their army careers pretty much. Now, to put all this in context, and I'll be worried because this is so controversial, very clear, I am not saying that rape was used commonly as a weapon of war by either the British Army or the Free State Army or the Republican Army. What I am saying is that incidents like this did happen. They were exceptional, but they did happen. Um, it's worth saying as well that the uh, Hazel Points, the uh, Miss, Miss Biggs and the uh, rape she suffered, um, it was the only one reported to the British Compensation Claims Commission, so these things were unusual. Go back look at Tom Manway and the killing um, of the loyalists, Protestant loyalists there. The Church of Ireland Synod actually says that that's a unique event. This is not happening all over the South. I think there's a comparable event which happens in Ockham Bay on the border as well, but we don't have time to go into that. Going back to the struggle um, between the two branches, uh, pro and anti treaty, this is Brigadier General George Adamson, Free State Army, killed by the IRA in Athlone, April 1922. Civil war hasn't started yet, the people are being killed. As I said, these different forces posturing against each other, and it does spill over into killing occasionally. Famous shot we've all seen it of the IRA coming down Grafton Street. The situation in Dublin by April 1922. The barracks have been handed over to the Free State. Large buildings like the four courts have been taken over by the IRA. Different sections of the IRA. There was all sorts of internal politics, but we won't go into that. Fighting does break out between the IRA and the Free State Army in Kilkenny during the first week of May. Again, we're over a month away from the War of Independence and fighting, or from the Civil War starting, and fighting was broken out. This was uh, stopped. Uh, a truce committee or a peace committee was formed. Ten Free State, or ten officers. Five Free State, five Republican Army. You can see members of them here identified, came together, tried to stop the side. It's a civil war. 
You see here the, the soldiers, again, you can see the, the obvious demarcation. The Free State soldiers outside their new uniforms, Republicans inside. Been fighting with each other a few hours earlier. Peace agreement reached in Kilkenny, shaking hands here for the cameras. What finally triggers the Civil War is not events in Ireland, it's an event in London. Civil War at this stage was pretty much um, inevitable. Uh, the possibility the IRA, with Collins' support, some branches of them did have a plan to invade the North. That could have changed things completely, but that uh, didn't happen. Um, this is Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson. Returning from Liverpool Street, or going into, you can see him reading his speech there, going into Liverpool Street Station in London to unveil a memorial to British soldiers killed in the First World War. And on his way home that evening, he is assassinated or killed or shot, murdered, whatever you want to call it, by two members of the IRA. Huge debate about whether Collins had ordered it, whether whoever had ordered it, but he shot at his home. Incidentally, this is the spot. The last time I was in London doing research, I went and spent several hours finding the exact spot where he was shot. Everyone says he was shot in Eaton Square. He wasn't. He was shot around the corner in Eaton Place. But what do you notice? And you can see from the photos the exact same point. What do you notice about the building and where those people are standing is the exact spot where Wilson was killed? There's no plaque. There's no statue. A British field marshal is killed. The guy is buried beside Admiral Nelson under St. Paul's Cathedral. He doesn't even get a brass plaque. Not at the place he was shot, anyway. There is um, one in Liverpool Street There is one in Liverpool Street Station. Yeah. I've been there, I've seen it. But you would think the point where he was assassinated would be marked. And I've seen his tomb in St. Paul's, and I've seen the, um, it says on his inscription, murdered, but not at the spot he was shot. Um, which raises the question as well, what are events in Britain going to be like during the decade of St. Theories? But to finish up, anyway, the IRA um, are still occupying the four courts. Um, initially, the British government seems to think that the IRA have ordered Wilson's assassination. Uh, they have plans at one stage themselves to actually go and take the IRA out of the four courts, but they put pressure on Collins to do it. Michael Collins and the Free State Army don't want to be seen to be acting on British orders, um, so they, they get lucky when um, Ginger O'Connell, the Free State officer, is captured and taken prisoner inside the uh, inside the four courts, and then this gives the excuse that the um, or the that the Free State need to go in. Uh, the British had offered, by the way, British RAF planes painted with a tricolour, like you can see here, to bomb the, uh, the four courts. Uh, this one was going to use later in the Civil War. The Free State Government turned that offer down. However, the job was done with uh, British borrowed artillery. That is the fighting you can see at the beginning of the Civil War, um, which John Dorney is going to cover in the next lecture. But I just want to talk very briefly one or two things about how bitter that became. It's a photograph of a group of 1916 veterans from Marabone Lane Garrison. What do you notice about the back row? Airbrush. Two of them are missing. <laughs> haven't been airbrushed, but they've been painted out of it. When we talk about airbrushing, we think of uh, Russia okay, in, in later period. This is a picture of uh, Lenin and Trotsky. This was taken, if you believe, in the Kenny speechwriter on their uh, trip to West Cork to meet Michael Collins. <laughs> um, but watch the next photo. Trotsky disappears. Falls out of favor, he's taken out of it. This happens in photos of the War of Independence period to reflect civil war politics. Now, I'm not sure if this is the reason why this man is taken out. I suspect it might be. This is Dr. Ryan of Capital White. Painted out. <laughs> okay. The Civil War. Um, this is the wedding photograph of Kevin O'Higgins. Okay? His best man is Rory O'Connor. What's De Valera doing? He's photo bombing it, basically. Uh, De Valera had a habit of turning up at weddings like Tom Barry's wedding and actually sat in between the bride and groom uh, in the wedding photograph, which seems a bit odd to me. Proper contraception. <laughs> <laughs> a very effective one, I imagine. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, I won't go further on that right. But, um, going back to more serious matter, this, is, this wedding happens during the truce period, and uh, O'Higgins' best man is Rory O'Connor. O'Connor was there one of the 77 executed by the Free State Army during the Civil War. 
And uh, O'Higgins, this, this comes up in the debate, um, in a political debate, and he's accused of all sorts of malice and everything. And he says, malice, vindictiveness, good heavens. One of these men is a friend of mine. And that takes me on to the, the finishing quote on um, just one or two slides after this from Frank Aiken, who began, I think, the Civil War neutral and ended up coming in on the Republican side. He said, war with the foreigner brings to the fore all that is best and noblest in a nation. Civil war, all that is mean and base. Uh, a lot of the history I've talked about here and a lot of the photographs I've used come from my last book, Revolution. Um, I have copies here, available in all good bookshops or online from uh, mercyorpress.ie. Uh, and I do have a website myself, warofindependence.info. So I've talked long enough, I'm going to stop there. And thank you very much for listening. Okay, so uh, again, I'd like to thank Cork for a uh, typically provocative and opinionated talk, you won't mind me saying. Um, one thing that Cork has highlighted here, which is important to remember when we talk about all of this stuff, I think, is how ugly many of the details of the independence struggle actually are. So people, real people were killed, real people lost their lives. Um, so, but just to recap before we start questions, uh, Cork has argued that um, the War of Independence escalated right up to the end, that it was, was still escalating in terms of violence when it finished, that the end, the truce was brought about by political crisis in the British military means that they were available to have a war of extermination, as, one, as McCready himself said, but the political means were not there. The political will was not there to do it. From the IRA's point of view, Cork has argued that while areas of the IRA were weak, other areas were going stronger. So it's, it's not a military decision to choose, it's a political crisis. And Cork has argued that the political split in the Republican movement over the treaty was highly personal. He's illustrated that very well, I think, with the airbrush pictures. And nothing could be more personal than denying someone's existence after the fact because of the political split. Um, Pork has talked about the chaos of early 1922 when there was three rival armies in the country, the British Army, the anti-treaty IRA, and the pro-treaty IRA becoming what they termed the National Army or the Free State Army. And in this chaos, Pork has talked about various, various controversial questions, sectarian question, the killings of the Manway in April 1922, where 13 Protestants um, were killed in circumstances that are still being argued about today. Um, Pork has also, again, brought up the question of sexual assault and rape. Um, which did happen during the truce. And I think, while this is not uh, widespread as Pork has argued, it's a very worthwhile thing to bring up because, again, what happens to civilians when there is no civil authority, when military people or people with arms are uh, the masters of a country? I think we have an example of this in Ireland in, in early 1922, regardless of politics. And sexual assault can be one of the results of this. And finally, Pork has argued that the civil war was triggered, was possibly inevitable, given that there were two rival armies in the country, but that it was triggered by the assassination in London of Henry Wilson, Field Marshal Wilson, who, whose death the British Army ordered Collins, on whose death the British Army ordered, or the British government, excuse me, ordered Michael Collins to act against the anti-treaty side. So after that summation, I'd like to open the floor to questions. I'm sure there are lots of questions. Where is Ray Fennel? Welcome to the points. Um, I'll start off, Cork, um, but just on the killings of the war independence and the informers, um, the Protestants' share in Cork, because this is a very controversial question, was 30%. Is this not out of line with their share of the population in County Cork? I'll be honest with you, I don't know, um, I, 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 I caution there are suspected spies. There's no piece of evidence, 100%, which is going to tell you whether these people were actually informers or not. And you can get some good stuff from British records and compensation claims where there's a guy shot by the IRA and the British accept liability for his killing. And you go, God, why is that happening? And you go through British records and you try to find it, but his file isn't there. For some reason, they're not a conspiracy theorist, but people do talk about files and archives and <coughs> read it. Um, I don't know the demographics of Cork that intimately. Um, I am not ruling out entirely the possibility that someone could have used sectarianism uh, to, uh, to kill people that they had a prejudice against, you'll find bigots everywhere. You could have had people using it to set world scores, all sorts of stuff. But the idea that's put out there at the moment that there's huge sectarianism, um, I have uh, difficulties with. And in particular, I have a problem with anonymous victims. I think one thing for war of independence, no anonymous quotes 
from anonymous people and no anonymous victims. I don't want to be reading that 20 people were killed and buried in the bog. Okay, name them. You know, you look at IRA ambushes, and I talked about the Barretts and the War of Independence, and the Barretts would say they killed 16 people in the Monreal ambush in Clare. I have the British records. Not a single uh, British soldier or RIC man was killed in that ambush. So the numbers there are 30% killed, and it is higher. But then again, weren't the Protestants a uh, loyalist population in Cork very strongly linked with the British military? If you look at Barry Keane's research on the um, number of, of Protestants dropping in West Cork after independence, a uh, huge amount of them are actually linked with the British military. Uh, Protestants under the penal laws in other times, and particularly uh, Anglicans, Presbyterians have been treated as well, were, um, uh, they have been treated quite favourably by the British government. They have been the established church. Why wouldn't they have had a loyalty to British, uh, British um, authority in later years? Same reason why wouldn't an ex-soldier have had a loyalty? It's completely natural. Or if you disaggregate the figures, the population percentage, Protestant Catholic, for the north of Ireland, mm -hmm. what does it come out? You mentioned a figure of 25%. I presume that's the country as a whole. That's the country now, as a whole. If you disaggregate that, it may just suggest that the number of Protestants killed were higher than the number of Catholics yes. in terms within the 26 county, county area. I haven't done that. Uh, haven't done that yet. It may um, it may prove that all right. The thing is that when you get percentages of Protestant population time is generally given for Ireland as a whole rather than for a 26 county area. And even if we took the 26 counties, as I mentioned, there's a lot of counties like Mayo. There was no spy shot at all. So again, further work needs to be done in this area. But all I'm saying is, it's not that clear. It would be it's interesting. To get it could be. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, no, I've done that yet. Just one thing on that. I come from. Maybe it's Ireland's Crimea, West Cork. <laughs> <Right. laughs> and uh, unfortunately, I don't have figures, but I, I do know that there's probably a higher level of Protestant population. The wall, certain walls, and there still is, than other parts of the yeah. south. Of Ireland. As I said, like uh, Bandon used to be known as the Little Derry or the South. Or even pigs for or Protestant, Protestant going back to the famous penal decree over the over our alleged decree. You don't know is it actually true. But the other thing I should say about my figures there is my research is going up to the 11th of July 1921. Those figures do not include on Manway and other things. And I'm open to the argument that sectarianism wasn't really as dominant in the War of Independence, but got worse as the anarchy in the Civil War progressed. Okay, so the gentleman down the back here. Yeah, I don't know where to start actually. Okay. You know. I'm old fashioned enough to believe that history, I saw this, always the point. There's always some argument behind it. And look, let, let me take up a few things. Sure. This stuff about the British Army and the atrocities committed, and the atrocities the IRA committed, armies, wars, that's what happens. I'm not just a man, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but that's what happens. But are you suggesting that somewhere or other that the British were less respectable than the Irish, than the, 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 the IRA, that the, the IRA were more humane or more decent and more gentlemanly than the British. I don't think that stands up because wars generally, execution of prisoners, not supposed to happen, does happen. Yeah. Uh, and I, 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 I agree with you, both sides, as I said, neither one is, 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 is a big good or committing killings. What I'm saying is, I think in, in the history that has been presented to us, there is an ordinate focus on. Uh, Republican killings, but not on British. Okay, well that's a line, you see. That's a particular line. Yeah, yeah. But we don't want the other line either. Um, I have my own line, of course. Uh, <laughs> no, I, mean, I, I did talk about, let's say, if we take the, the, the very controversial issue of rape, I talked about rape by uh, British forces, by alleged Republicans, and it seems to have been Republicans, or people call themselves that, and by free state troops. So I'm not, I think I'm being as balanced as I can, despite my own. Well, let me just pick up on another. So this is about Connolly and the other chap, Tom Barry, I mean, ex British Army, that's true. <coughs> uh, and you said then that you know, there was no real animus against ex British soldiers and all the rest. But they were British soldiers before the rising, they were British soldiers before, and it, in fact, they finished being British soldiers, I'm sure, by the rise. Connolly did certainly, and I'm sure Barry did as well. Barry was so, in Iraq at the time fighting for yeah, And also, you have a table there, the table you put up about how many Protestants or the percentage of Protestants killed, actually, a lot of them seem to be not Protestant, but ex 
British soldiers. Yeah. You know, so that actually, in a way, undermines your sort of, your figures are very good, your research is very good, but it, it, there's a little bit of a contradiction there, I think. And, and I can't quite finish that. I'm going to be soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's other people waiting to get inside. I know, I know. There's some more questions. It's quite important. It's quite important because after history, and it's about what people do here, you know, sure. people people sure. people sure. people one more point, please. Yeah, so look. You, your man spoke, uh, Aiden. It's in his, if you just put it back up there, if you just put it back up, yeah, you sure. know, and it's a terrible quote, really. War is, is with the farm. It's typically fascist, actually. Typically fascist. And finally, you forgot to mention that the treaty, you know, the treaty was accepted by the majority of people here. The, there was a civil war, there was a civil war in Finland. Okay, okay. 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 between Before we go to and I can address your other points, okay? Uh, regarding ex-soldiers being shot, yeah, I think it's 48% of those uh, suspected spies, civilians uh, killed uh, are British, uh, ex-British soldiers, an equal number were not. The point I would make about that is unemployment was huge for ex-British soldiers at the time. Uh, ex-British soldiers seem to have been particularly hard up. Um, if you would serve in the British Army and you'd been trained in a certain, uh, certain way, it would encourage you to be loyal to that army later if a war happens. The British Army recruited Irish ex-British soldiers into them during the War of Independence. Now, I'm sure they ju didn't just use them for barrack fatigue uh, duties. Um, as to IRA men, um, uh, and ex-British soldiers, the IRA were willing to accept British soldiers who had defected. Reginald Hathaway, Walter, uh, Walter Stellings, um, uh, Charlie Chigley in the Midlands, Peter Monaghan in Cork. And I think it wasn't whether someone was an ex-British soldier or not. It was whether they displayed a loyalty to the British forces or not. And the other point about the, uh, the Civil War and people had voted for it, did they vote for it at the point of the gun? When Lloyd George, when Lloyd George, I'll let you speak, no, let me speak, please. Did Lloyd George say, you can take this envelope, which has the treaty, or this is immediate and terrible war? The other thing is, and we often forget about this during the decade of centenary, is the position of women. Women did not have a full vote during, um, during the, uh, the, the, the uh, vote on the, uh, the treaty, and it wasn't the plebiscite that was voting for candidates one way or the other. And it's interesting that all the women in the door ended up going, uh, going anti-treaty. And the other thing is, a lot of the young men who've been fighting in the war weren't registered to vote, because they weren't going to do that in the middle of the war, when turning up to a fish and could get them shot. So look, uh, regarding having points, I think the overall point I'm trying to make is that things are not black and white. There are a, a lot of grey areas here, sure. and if a problem with history, when it is presented as black and white, I'm trying to explore the grey. Okay, I'll just, say, just, sorry, just the order of questions there, sorry, so I'm going to go, this, this lady at the back, then this gentleman at the front, and then yourself, okay? So yeah, go ahead. And his family were burned out. I have the tipping from the Irish Times, and he had to move his family away, and his place was burned. And he was a brother. He was very decent. And he, was, he was burned out by? And by black and tans. By black and yeah. tans. So I was just saying it wasn't out of the one way. I, 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 I just want to say this gentleman, the Republican courts are always forgotten. You know, people are always saying, oh, there was chaos, there was nowhere to go. The Republican courts were being my broken words, and the, in fact, there was still competition between the RIC and the Republican courts. They were still well, shutting the, them down the in early They did, it did but the problem, the problem was that there were competing authorities, and there, there was chaos because no courts needed the Republican uh, uh, court. Uh, uh, I don't agree with that. Yeah. That's just okay, so. um, um, Maxwell, was he the man who was shot the time the Civil War broke out? That was, that was John Collins' article. So. Awesome. It's, 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 it's still, we, don't, we don't have the piece of paper proving that. <laughs> okay? So again, gray areas. Well, I'm actually, yeah. funny enough, I'm actually talking more about the media now, reporting uh, propaganda. Well, well, that, yeah, yeah. The media at the time, if you're to look for that, it was all propaganda, so that makes it more difficult. Yeah, I just, want to, I just want to reply a little bit on that point there. If you look at what was actually happening on the ground in 1922, there are a number of problems. Number one, the British authority is not really working anymore, but parts of it are still trying to work. For example, in the border region, which I've been looking at, the RIC is still trying to close down the Republican courts in early 1922. At the same time, the British army is being evacuated from the town centres. So who's actually in charge? Whose law is the law? Nobody really knows. And against this background, you have crime, a lot of crime, which I've all sides complained about. You have a war basically on the border and between the IRA and the Ulster Specials. You have 
the vestiges of violence from more independence. So the, the re, it's not a, it's not an anti, certainly not an anti-republican theory, but there is actually chaos in the ground. The other thing, John, is if you have a sheet for the court, is it pro-treaty or anti-treaty? Again, it's not a chaos. We'll go to the next question. Uh, I just want to make a point because sure. it's always very interesting to discuss the morality of other pages. But if any of you have seen the famous documentary on Robert McNamara, The Fall of War, in it, he was asked about the Vietnam War. And he said, there is no morality in war. Mm. Once war starts, there's only one purpose, and that is to win it. Indeed. And morality is forgotten. OK, well, the, there's a famous quote um, from an American general who says, the point of war is not to make, uh, not to die for a country, it's to make the other war some of the bitch die for his. And I think that's the point I'm making. That yeah. The, the, the that point I'm making the point. is that when you read history in books and read Quite a lot of the time you get, oh, the irate and fighting in the fox that are not a proper army and the rules of war don't apply. But I'm making the point the British and the Irish, and I think I agree with you in a lot of ways when it comes to revenge killings, when it comes to the rules of war, weren't obeyed by either side. I think I said that in the lecture, because for a lot of the time they just the didn't feel the problem. Okay, okay. again, your questions. I'm going to go to the minister first, and then we'll go to yourself, and then yourself, okay? Yeah. Uh, getting back to the question, uh, you gave more detail than even the signal. Uh, John Bowen-Ogle's lecture about the Chimeras, and, mm -hmm. and he mentioned that that was a, a, not an act of war. And ostensibly it wasn't because, of course, the, the women raped weren't Republicans. But uh, I think it's more complex than that. I actually think it was an act of war because uh, uh, it was an act of revenge in the context of Niall Harrington, a uh, free state officer, exposing Paddy O'Daly for the Paddy CD incident and bringing complaints up to Dublin. Niall Harrington was the, the boyfriend of one of those girls. And when, 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 when they were raped, uh, O'Daly actually accused Harrington and a, a friend of Harrington's uh, as having been the rapist, and that, that was discounted. So it seems to be an act of, of, of sheer vengeance on the part of O'Daly. Uh, Indirectly getting apparent for a very to expose to make to make the point it was free state on free states all this. Yeah. And the other thing is what I said there about rape not being a weapon of war, what I'm saying is this is not the Red Army going into Germany in World War II. This is not the Balkans. I'm saying these kind of things. Well, it was an act of political But, but you, 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 yeah, but you couldn't say that the Free State Army was using rape. No, no, it's not rape. Yeah. It was so unusual because otherwise I think you would have seen a pattern of O'Day and his cohorts having done it to Republicans. And, look, and, was, and again, yeah. there is a lot more to this obviously manus than I just skimmed across top of There's IRB politics and everything, mm -hmm. but I agree with most of what you said. You suffered? You didn't mention that for example, with what's happening today in Ukraine. And uh, where the West is defending the human rights of the people. So it's wrong for the Russian soldiers to be on Ukraine. So it goes up down the right for British soldiers to be on that direction. We're the only occupied country in Europe. Well, what, what, I, what I'd say on that is I'm a historian, not a modern politician. The reason why I mentioned Ukraine was just what I wanted to get a modern analogy for what we were seeing in the past, something that could bring it to your mind easily. So I'm talking about the chaotic scramble in Ukraine at the moment for barracks and position and political prowess. That's what it was like as the British withdrew. I'm not directly comparing Ireland to Ukraine in that region. There's a long history which I'm not expert on. No. And we won't go into modern politics in the case. The makes And life is great. Okay, yeah, quick, quick, quick. yes, sir. Yeah. You made a, an intriguing reference to the cycle priest, father of Anakin, yes. his position, uh, in view of the fact that he was an important person in the uh, first hour of the cycle, you said you had the first. What was it that you were going to say, but you didn't finish? Oh, sorry. Uh, well, Flanagan was involved in early truce negotiations in December of 19. Uh, September, October, November of 1920. He basically seems to have sent a telegram to the British government who was uh, all sorts of political developments in Galway, but basically on his own that, he sent a unilateral telegram to the British government saying, Ireland is ready for peace, what's that first move do you suggest? Now, the thing is, he didn't have authority, he didn't speak for the IRA, firstly he spoke for the kind of political class in, in Sinn Féin, he didn't have authority to do this from De Valera, Collins, Griffith, it was a solo run, and the other thing is he had a slightly different policy. His argument was on the north, 
that um, the unionists, the loyalists were there who couldn't change their mind. He would have been happy with the Republic, and I think he was on the record that for pretty much the 26 counties. And that's the point I was making about him and his involvement in negotiating the truce. Or I tend to disagree with him. Do you have any breakdown now of the number of volunteers or Protestants on the Irish frontiers in Ira? Uh, no, but I can tell you there is someone doing a PhD in it in Trinity College at the moment. I can tell you they're not as rare as they think. For, uh, as you think, for example, in Limerick City, you have uh, Franz Hasselbeck, or not Franz Hasselbeck, Otto Hasselbeck, and he's from the German Protestant family. A lot of um, Palatine's German Protestants came over. Um, <coughs> people like Frank Busted, who are uh, mixed marriage, um, who I think declared himself an atheist in later life. Uh, you have people like the Gray family, who were from mixed marriage, were brought up and educated Presbyterian, but, and in later life were Presbyterian, but for some reason are now in the census as Catholics. Um, the Citizen Army, and they were active in Dublin during the War of Independence, have Protestants in it as well. I think Conor Morrissey is the guy in Trinity College who was writing on that. Um, if you look at County Clare, for example, I'm not aware of any Protestants fighting in the flying column in County Clare, but I can tell you that the Mid Clare Brigade's uh, uh, doctor was Stuart, and he was an Ulster Protestant. I can tell you if you look at um, Erskine Childers, Robert Barton, and uh, they are more Sinn Féin, but not only involved with the IRA, they're Protestants as well. Okay, we're nearly out of time, so what I'm going to ask is, anyone who still wants to ask a question, put your hand in the air, we'll ask them all, and Corey can respond to them. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, anyone else? One, two, three, okay, I'll take three more questions, quick as you can, please. Okay. Yeah. Um, quickly, uh, as far as I can, it is concerned, you very, very good, good point. But my impression is that uh, the sectarian component of the uh, attacks uh, became of the uh, in IRA attacks which became more notable after the beginning of the problems in the law. But I would say that, that uh, they have stimulated them, and they stimulated them in sort of to a greater degree as the struggle itself got, got hotter. Uh, it would be interesting to know. Um, politi well, the second thing is politically, uh, the, uh, I think uh, you don't mention the, uh, the non-election up to the second oil in uh, 1921, when uh, every, there wasn't a single seat contested and Sinn Féin swept the board except the Trinity, of course. Um, but to that, uh, no, it, uh, no, the NHS uh, played uh, considerably pressure on the British British. Opinion. Okay, two, two, point, two points there. Just hold that thought for a second before you get. Um, get just regarding one of the points you made about uh, the fact that a lot of the sectarian or the, the, the attacks by Crown forces, uh, atrocities by Crown forces during the, the War of Independence were carried out by Irish Catholics on um, Irish Catholics. I mean, given the fact that thousands of Irishmen, Irish Catholics, were in the police force, which before the war break of the war was a perfectly acceptable police force for most Irish people. And they were basically, from what I've been driven crazy by the fact there was a massive assassination campaign against them by the IRA <coughs> to start it off, that if it wasn't uh, uh, justifiable, but certainly understandable, but that they, were, they reacted or overreacted. Okay, great. Yep, yeah, we'll have to for a second again. One more question, and then we'll try to answer all three together. Yeah, you mentioned there were three arms. I'm just curious, the view of the FBI being regarded uh, as a forward army. Oh, the special are the Ulster specials are a forward army. Oh, they're, you know, we're even on the special. Very quickly, this is like history speed dating. Um, the <laughs> UVF essentially have become the special constabulary, pretty much lock, sock, and, and bar, and I would include them as part of the, uh, the British, uh, British forces. Um, regarding uh, Irishmen in the, uh, in the RIC, yes, huge amount of Irishmen in the RIC. I would say that the force of reputation was mixed. If you look at things like, and I know it was mainly the DMP, but the RIC were also involved in the, uh, in the lockout. Um, but the point I made there was, look, not all the black and tans were English, not all the Irish black and tans were orange, northern, loyalist, Protestants. I'm again stressing that history is a grey area. And um, that's, oh, why, why wouldn't you have found Irishmen in the RIC? It was a, a very good job. But there's a great book by Thomas Fennell on the RIC, and he argues that, look, I was an RIC constable. It was a job for us at the time. 
we didn't realize when we got into it that the whole point of the force seemed to be to back up land royalism and to back up uh, British rule. But again, the RIC, very interesting force, but again, let's take the, the, the black and white out of it, huge areas of, of grey there. Um, I think I did mention the 1921 uh, election, but I did say um, that I was focusing mainly on, uh, on military stuff. And the first question you asked me? About uh, the question of the... Oh, oh, sectarianism yeah. possibly getting worse because of what was happening in Belfast. It could be because of what was happening in Belfast. It could also be that um, things were just getting more chaotic at that time and it was coincidental. But again, the whole point is, um, you know, ask questions, read history. Don't just sail through the decade of commemorations waving flags and many reads. Things like this, things like history Ireland hedge schools, um, debates, discussion, that's what we need. We need to come up with it knowing more than we went into. And the last thing, if I can remind you before we go, <laughs> I think we're done. I'm flying books. <laughs> <laughs>